understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, for a couple of days, I've been actually sharing about the Holy Spirit. And I have promised to carry on and be able to just simply enlighten us or probably just bring to remembrance that of which, of course, we know about the Holy Spirit. As we know over the world that actually is believers, navigating through the journey of life and most of the journey of faith is not quite pragmatic without the involvement and most of the help of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, from a personal scale, I would want to simply share with us from the words of Jesus Christ himself when he spoke as regarding to the Holy Spirit and the kind of involvement he will be able to put to play in our lives. And of course, he also look at different, uh, rather probably Apostle Paul largely also, on how he was able to simply speak broadly about the Holy Spirit. Now I want us to just look at uh, the recording, the account of John. He was able to put to account the statements of the words that were being put across with Christ. Of course, John 14, John 15, and John 16. Christ was supposed to if, uh, uh, kind of you know, give more emphasis but emphatically speak about the Holy Spirit. Now when you look at John chapter number 16, Christ was about to make these particular statements. He was sharing with uh, his disciples during that time, during his earthly ministry, on what he's about to encounter. Of course, when you look at from verse number uh, from verse number, of course, 9, 10, but of course I want us to look at from verse number 12, which was directly being communicated to the disciples. Uh, the Bible says, I still have many things. That is to say, there were a lot of things that Christ was simply sharing with the disciples, but was able to make a very, very uh, important statement here said I have many still many things to say to you but you are not able to bear them to take them upon you or grasp them now this is to say that as Christ was simply sharing with them the heavenly mysteries the ability to be able to understand at that particular point he was able to realize that it was not quite possible they were not able to grasp everything, so to speak. But then he said, verse number 13, But when the Holy, he the Holy, he the Spirit of truth, rather, the truth giving Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. We are looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer and also even a minister, so to speak. Christ basically came to relate to every single person the truth the truth that the father had simply you know uh, can't even know the truth of course I not even say that the father the fact remains that Christ himself is the truth so he had come to simply bring the truth and when you look at John chapter number one the Bible John recalls and say that the law came with Moses, while grace and truth came with Christ Jesus. That is in the book of John chapter number 1, if we just check out the readings. So in this particular reading, it says, But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit, you realize that he, he is trying to make them to understand that whatever he's sharing with them is nothing less but the truth and the consistency of this truth is going to be uh, uh, relayed further by the Holy Spirit. He'll guide in all truth, the whole truth, for we will not speak of his own message or his own authority, but he will tell you whatever he has from 
uh, the forever hears from the Father. He will give the message that he has been given to him. He will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in their future. She was going to simply make the future not become uh, a mystery as it is to a lot of people around the world. But for them that are born again, you're born again, you're filled of the Holy Spirit. The future is not supposed to be a mystery to us. It's supposed to be quite obvious, supposed to be quite revealed to us because one of the major works of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us the mysteries of God, the mysteries of the future. We are not supposed to live as a people that are so believers, that are so veiled where the truth regarding the future is concerned from a personal level and even from, of course, from national level. You know, we need to be able to understand it, to know the truth as for what is happening now and what is going to happen later in the days that are ahead, as the Bible puts it clearly as he said he will not speak of his own his own message that is to say he will be able to convey that which is in the heart of the father for the sake of our benefit for the sake of us understanding and by having that proper understanding then you're able to know what we ought to do how we ought to do it based on this consciousness of the truth that has been relayed to us by the holy spirit as you know very well we are living in a time where but deception has become so prevalent across the nations of the world because the enemy is always behind deception. I said this last time according to John chapter 8 verse number 44. Christ was made of make, was able to make it crystal clear that Satan is the father of all lies and when he speaks lies it is like a native language. It's natural to him because there is no truth in him neither does he stand in truth he always stands for what is false or other falsehood that is what he perpetuates around uh, the world so Christ was able to make us understand he was able to the disciples which of course is also to it's meant for our benefit as believers of this particular time the Bible says he'll give the message that he has been given to him he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future, we'll be able to have a proper understanding where the prophetic is concerned. Now, whether it's being spoken through prophets or whether it's being spoken directly to us by the Holy Spirit, the fact remains we ought to have this understanding. If it's from the prophetic disposition, then the prophet, of course, they have to speak from the consciousness of truth at the end of the day. However, as a believer, the Holy Spirit is not limited just to the office holders. The Holy Spirit is actually given to every single person and every believer is meant to be able to understand the seasons, the prophetic happenings and unfoldings as it is taking place in our time. And of course he says, he will hone and glorify me because he will take and receive, draw upon what is mine and reveal, declare, disclose, transmit to you. Another thing that we will be able to understand, the Holy Spirit of God in us, he is meant to honor and glorify our Lord and our Savior. Why? Because he will take off, receive, draw upon what is mine. He revealed, declared, disclosed, transmit to you. Now the Holy Spirit, uh, of course, we'll be able to look at it, uh, look at the subject of the Holy Spirit largely, but then when you look at this particular verse, Jesus was able to make it clear, he said he will honor, he'll glorify me because he will take upon that which is mine. Now, as ministers, as believers, everything that we do have is subject to Christ. Jesus said at some point, all that the Father has is mine. And that's why he said he will take that which is mine and transmit it to you. So we as ministers and we as believers, we have to be extremely cautious in what sense, in the sense that all that we do, credit does not simply, is not simply accorded us. Because if the Holy Spirit is the one in charge of the church, 
which was founded by Christ himself. If the Holy Spirit is, is the one that is pragmatic in the church, the one that is actively involved in the church, then we have to be able to understand one thing, that we as believers, we as ministers, it is not us that is supposed to honor. He is supposed to honor and glorify Christ who has called us as his servants to carry out the assignment that he gave to us. He first gave the disciples, then of course has been passed over to us that are serving in this particular season and time. And with this understanding, then I'll be able to put this across to all of us that everything that is going on in the church, if it is the work of the Father, if it is the work of Christ being, you know, actualized by the Holy Spirit, then the person that is supposed to be the subject of focus in terms of honor and glorification, it is none other but Jesus Christ, because the Bible said the Holy Spirit uh, and this is the words of Christ himself, remember? These are the words of Jesus Christ. He said that he will honor and glorify me because he will take over, receive, draw upon what is mine and will reveal, declare, disclose, transmit to you. That is to say, whatever we are receiving as prompted by the Holy Spirit, it is of course subject to Christ. And when the Holy Spirit brings it, the person that ends up glorified is Jesus Christ. Then verse 15, which I was just simply trying to say, to ask before, everything that the Father has is mine. If you look at your Bibles, my translation, the Amplified, has a full stop at the end. It's a full sentence. Jesus says, everything that the Father has is mine. Everything that the Father has is mine. Everything that the Father has is mine. Mind. He's addressing the disciples. He's addressing the disciples. Don't forget that. Then he says, that is what I meant when I say that he will, he the spirit will take the things that are mine and reveal, declare, disclose, transmit it to you. You see? So Christ was simply helping the disciples to understand, even us as well, that all the things that the Father has are subject to Christ, or they have been handed over to Christ. And therefore, now Christ, when he prays that I'm going to pray that the Father may send you another comforter that will come to simply help you out. So he was trying to put across this to them that this is what he's going to basically be doing. He'll guide in all truth. He'll make you be able to understand the things that you can understand now. And besides that, he'll be able to take what is mine. No any believer, no any minister across the universe can be able to put claim in the thing that they so have to be their own. No, everything we have is subject to Christ. As Christ said, all that the Father has is mine. Very important. So at the end of the day, the person, because we as a people, we are created. Number one, Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our own image and likeness. Genesis 2.7, and God formed man out of dust. Number three, you need to understand we never saved ourselves. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for our sake so that he can become the righteousness of God. The righteousness we have is not ours. It has been imputed on us. So the righteousness we have is the righteousness of Christ. Nobody can claim I've labored and worked for my righteousness by myself. No. It's Christ who paid the ultimate price on the cross of Calvary for us to be able to become the beneficiaries of this righteousness, which now has prompted us to be able to, number one, have the Holy Spirit, number two, be able to relate with our Heavenly Father without any impediment. So we have to be cautious of this truth and this reality that all that the Spirit of the Lord is transmitting to us, it is coming 
directly from Jesus Christ who has been handed over from by the Father according to the scriptures as we just reading so having said that it is very important that as we carry out the work of God in these last days the work of the ministry we have to be very very clear that the Holy Spirit of God his work is to guide us in truth to reveal the truth to show us the things that are yet to happen in the future and also to simply glorify Christ honor Christ based on that which is transmitting to the church you know and to the ministers and to the believers at large now uh, I want us to still go further and look at what the Bible says or rather what Paul was about to put across very interesting First Corinthians chapter 2 Paul writes to these brethren the book of First Corinthians chapter number 2 as for myself brethren when I came to you I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony the evidence or mystery and secret of God concerning what he has done through Christ for the salvation of men in lofty words of eloquence of human philosophy and wisdom in other words Paul had already ruled out that the information is trying to bring across to this particular brethren the testimony is giving uh, regarding Christ is not based on human philosophy not based on human finding no he goes further and you know just like you know use just mere human wisdom or eloquence no he says father number two for i resolved to know nothing to be acquainted with nothing to make this uh, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing to be cautious of nothing among except jesus christ the messiah and him crucified look at what paul is trying to simply help us to understand he says please listen carefully i resolved to know nothing to be acquainted with nothing to make a display of the knowledge of nothing and to be cautious of nothing among except Jesus Christ the Messiah and him crucified so Paul simply says he was more he was cautious of Christ as opposed to being cautious of what he may have known humanly speaking he goes further and says and I was and I was in passed into a state of weakness and fear, dread and great trembling after I had come among you. He says, My language and my message were not said uh, were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit, the power and approved by the Spirit and the power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers and the mostly holy emotions thus persuading them. He speaks about the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men human philosophy but in the part of God you see there is a probability of people simply anchoring or establishing their faith on human philosophy please listen there's a difference of human philosophy human findings and the faith that is founded on the death and the crucifixion the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of course the power of God verse 6 he goes further and says yet when we were among full-grown spiritual mature christians who arrived in understanding we do impart high wisdom knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden but is indeed not a wisdom of this present age or this world nor of the leaders or the rulers of this age who are being brought to nothing uh, and are doomed to pass away 
verse 7. But rather we are setting forth the wisdom of God once hidden from human understanding. So Paul is making it crystal clear that, you know, in the previous ages, the wisdom of God was basically hidden from uh, from humanity. Then he says that, uh, but rather we are setting forth is a wisdom of God once hidden from the human understanding now be revealed to us by God that wisdom which device decreed before the ages for our glorification to lift us up, lift us into the glory of his presence, to lift us up into the glory of his presence. Verse 8, none of these rulers of this age or world perceived interesting Paul just simply mentioned about the rulers meaning there are many and the rulers of this age or world perceived organized understood this for if they had they would have never crucified the Lord of glory God made sure they were not able to understand and they went went further or rather went ahead and crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I want us to look at what uh, the point that I wanted to put across, I've read, in, I've, I've kind of read quite a lengthy passage, but I want to simply bring to our attention verse 9, 10, and the rest of the verses, you know. So verse 9 says, But on the contrary, as the scripture says, What eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, has not entered into the heart of man, all that the God has prepared and made and keeps ready for those who love him, hold him affectionate, a reverence promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Verse 10. Yet to us, God has revealed them by and through his spirit. So what the world is not aware of we that are born again as again had said initially when christ told the disciple that he would be able to announce the things that are yet to come he will take what is mine and transmit it to you so he is simply saying here that yet to us meaning if you are born again you are not left out paul says yet to us who is us it's like he's addressing two categories of persons they that are not born again or not to receive Christ in their lives and those that are born again that's why it comes to verse number 10 says yet to us God has revealed has unveiled rather revealed them by and through his spirit for the Holy Spirit searches diligently exploring examining everything even sounding and profound and bottomless things of God the divine counsels things hidden beyond man's scrutiny or man's Rich, that to say, anyone that does not have the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand, neither be able to receive the things of God. You can't be able to appreciate, not even appreciate, you can't even know the things of God, neither can even understand the things of God. So Paul says, to us we have a privilege he has revealed them to us this to say when you have the holy spirit able to understand and to know the mysteries of god that pertains to your life that pertains to the plans of god and the purpose of god where humanity uh, where the humankind is concerned you, you don't live in a life of you don't become oblivious, just as I said initially. You don't become a people, a person that is quite really uh, unaware of the thing that God is doing. Because the Holy Spirit is about to prompt you to help you to be able to learn to understand. Verse number 11. For what person perceives, knows, understands what passes through man's thoughts, except uh, the man's own spirit within him. So just so no one desires comes to know comprehend the thoughts of God except the spirit of 
go right except the Spirit of God. When we got to minister the Word, we got to based on what the mind of God is, what the thought of God is. We would prayerfully ask God and the Holy Spirit transmits what's in the heart of the Father, the heart of, uh, you know, he retransmits to us his, his will, his purpose regarding his people. So he's speaking the consciousness of what has been revealed to you by the Holy Spirit because he knows the heart and the mind of the Father. Then he says, uh, the Bible says, now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world. So Paul again speaks as we that are born again, we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world. That means that there is a spirit in the world there. But the Holy Spirit who is from God, we have the Holy Spirit has been given to us uh, who has come to us from God as Christ had made, they made a prayer or said he was going to pray in John chapter 14, 15 and 16 which we just read in John 16 so he made a prayer and now Paul says in the now tense he says now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world that means we have the Holy Spirit he is with us but are we cautious of him? Are we aware of him? Because we cannot understand his work in our lives until we appreciate his presence in our lives. If we don't know his, if we're not aware, if we're not cautious of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then it becomes very hard to be able to understand his work in our lives as believers. So the number one thing that we need to understand, Paul says, we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, given to us, that we might, now look at that again, as I said again, he will reveal issues to us, reveal things to us, mysteries to us. Paul puts across and says that we might realize, we have received the Holy Spirit who is from God, that we might realize the gifts of divine favor and blessing so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. Oh, God help us. Listen, as believers, we need to be quite aware. This particular chapter of 1 Corinthians right, has so much weight of revelation that Paul was able to simply put across for our own benefit and for our understanding. He says, Now we have not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit is from God, given to us that we materialize. The word that is used there is might realize, meaning we have to simply put an effort in order to be able to realize. We must collaborate with the Holy Spirit. It is not automatic. We must, number one, appreciate His presence in our lives. Appreciate His presence in our lives. And then, number two, be able to know what assignment He has in our lives. What He's supposed to do for our sake as believers. So He says, uh, realize, comprehend, and appreciate the gifts of divine favor, blessing so freely, lavished, bestowed on us by God. So there are gifts. There are gifts of divine favor and blessing so freely, lavished, bestowed on us by God. The Bible says gifts that have been bestowed to us by God. They mean they're already given to us. They're already there. In the realm of the Spirit, they are there. But how are we able to simply actualize? How are we able to simply uh, become recipients of this particular gift? Number one, the person is, that is behind revealing this reality to us or this gift to us is the Holy Spirit. And therefore, failure to appreciate and acknowledge His presence in your life as a person or in my life or even in the church there are many things that God has revealed to us that has given to earth as I was saying 
uh, the Anifas was trying to put across about the gifts that have been given to us freely by God. Remember what Christ said. He will take what is mine and transmit it to you. Nobody has anything of his own. All that we have, we have been given by the Lord. It's God has given us by Spirit. So nobody can claim ownership of these giftings, of these graces. No, they are given to us by God. Now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, given to us that we might realize, comprehend, appreciate the gifts of divine favor, blessings so freely lavished, bestowed on us by God, bestowed on us, given us, bestowed on us. They're already there, given to us by God. But the only way to understand and to know is by appreciating and acknowledging the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't be ignorant of this. The Bible says, I want you to understand something very important. Verse 13, let me read verse 13 first. And we are setting these truths forth in words taught not by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truth, spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. It takes the people that have the Holy Spirit to understand what Paul was trying to put across during that time. And this word stands to date and even eternally. So this is great truth that is meant to help us as believers in our time. If you don't know what is yours, then somebody else will take advantage and simply put a premium on it. For you to be able to get it, you have to simply, you know, it's good for every believer to grant mature. Very, very important. Verse number 14, the Bible says, but the nuns the natural, the non-spiritual man does not accept and welcome admit into his heart gifts, the teachings, revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are fully meaningless nonsense to him. He is incapable of knowing them, progressing, organizing, understanding, becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually designed and estimated and appreciated. Now, Someone might simply say, probably Paul, the context might be probably Paul was talking about the teachings, but there is much more than just the teachings. Of course, at the end of the day, in as much as the teachings is part of what Paul has been saying, or what has been according to us is gifts at the end of the day, but, you know, these blessings that come through this uh, demonstration of the things of God, they are meant to simply better us. But then the Bible says, the one who is not spiritual cannot be able to simply appreciate or be able to accept or admit these realities. Verse number, uh, okay, let me read verse 14 again. But the natural and spiritual man does not accept or welcome at me to his heart the gifts and teachings. Yeah, the gifts and the teachings and the revelations of the Spirit. For they are fully meaningless, meaning the gifts, the teachings, and the revelations of the Spirit. Listen, the gifts, the teachings, and the revelations of the Spirit of God. So whatever is being administered, it has to be by the Spirit of God. Whatever you are being conveyed to as a person, it has to be by the Spirit of God. And I will tell you, if it is the Spirit of God, He does not put a premium on it. He does not put a price tag on what He's transmitting to you. And never. If what you are saying is prompted by the Holy Spirit, then you will not tell somebody, give this amount of money, I'll pray for you. That is not the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that you have so freely been bestowed on, on each year. Verse 12. 
but the Holy Spirit who is, I'm just reading part B, who is from God, given to us that we must realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts, divine favor, blessing, so freely and uh, so freely, lavishly bestowed on us by God. So the Holy Spirit is able to help you to understand what is rightly yours and has been freely given to you as a person or as a believer. Verse 14, as I finish it. But the natural and spiritual man does not accept, welcome, admit into his heart the gift, the teaching, the revelation of the Spirit of God, for they are fully meaningless nonsense to him and is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing and understanding, become, becoming a better acquainted with them because they are spiritually designed and estimated and appreciated. Verse 15. But the spiritual man tries all things. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, designs all things. But a spiritual man tries all things. That's to say, a person that is spiritual, a person that is mature in the things that spirit is able to simply try all things, examines, he examines and investigates, inquires into questions and designs all things, yet he himself to be put on trial and judged by nah, no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly design or appraise or get an insight into him. Who has known and understood the mind and the counsels and the purposes of the Lord as to guide, instruct him, and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ the Messiah and do hold the thoughts, feelings, the purposes of his heart. How do we have all this? It's by the virtue of the Holy Spirit. Now look at the next chapter. It's a continuation. And look at what Paul now came to realize about this brethren. So he begins by saying, however brethren, I could not talk to a spiritual man. I could not talk to a spiritual man. What is the reason? But as to non-spiritual men of the flesh, in whom the carnal nature predominates, as to mere infants in the new life in Christ, unable to talk yet. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not yet strong enough to be ready for it, but yet you are not strong enough to be ready for it. You are still unspiritual, having the nature of the flesh under the control of ordinary impulses. For as long as there is there are envy and jealous wranglings, functions among you, are you not uns, unspiritual and of the flesh, behaving yourselves after the human standard, like mere unchanged men? So Paul wanted to speak deeper things to these particular brethren, but the way of conduct was still quite carnal. They were not able to simply, they had not measured up to the point where they were able to get deeper knowledge where the things of God are concerned. And Paul began to give the reasons. They are jealous, envy, wranglings, functions, all these things that are indicators of spiritual immaturity. And they are just showing that people have not grown in the things of the spirit. That's why today it is hard to say, number one, for you to discover what has been accorded to you by God, you have to appreciate the Holy Spirit. That's one. And number two, you have to simply allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that which is in line or that which is meant to be part of your life as a believer. Now, you ask yourself this question, why do even ministers, so to speak, keep fighting, keep envying, keep being jealous of each other? 
Why does it happen in the body of Christ? Why are we envious? Why are we jealous? Why do we feel bad when we see other people rising? If indeed what we are doing is as a result of the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit behind jealous? No. Is it behind envy? No. This is not just limited to the normal Christians. No. This also plays loud even among its ministers. Literally. That's why a lot of ministers, they want to become like so-and-so, become like all so-and-so. I like what one day this great man of God from Uganda, uh, Bishop Robert Kayanja, a man that has immensely also impacted my life over time. He said, how God calls you, you have to simply allow that to be sustained in life and grow in that dimension. You cannot be a person that is fluctuative because God uses everybody uniquely. God uses every person in their own unique way. And you must be able to understand and appreciate which way is God meant to use you as a person. Now the moment will begin to appreciate, I'm not talking about heresies, I'm not talking about the divination, I'm not talking about familiar spirits, I'm not talking about those cultic or occultic operations, I'm talking about genuine move of God. When we are able to appreciate and understand, because if you are fully led by the Spirit of God, you'll be able to tell this is the move of God and this is not the move of God. You can be able to tell. And then number two, the Holy Spirit cannot put in a state of feeling inferior or feeling jealous or becoming competitive. Why are we nowadays in the bed of trying to outdo each other? Overlooking each other, demeaning each other. Is that the Holy Spirit? Is that how he works? Is that not self playing loud in our time? That is self. The Holy Spirit is, able to, is meant to create harmony, is meant to glorify Christ, is meant to bring honor to the Lord. But we're just seeing in our time there is too much competition, too much strife, too much jealous, too much envy, not just among believers, but even among ministers. But what is the reason? When I know this is my place, this is what I'm supposed to do, I need to be satisfied with it. John the Baptist said, a man can never receive anything unless it be given to him by God from above. You can't be everybody. You can only be who God has made you to be. And if you don't know who you are and who God has made you to be and what he has given you and the assignment, the grace that is upon your life, then you're going to find yourself in a state of a vicious circle, a bitter cycle, you know, fighting anyone and anybody that is coming up or is doing something that seems to be totally different from what you're doing. And please get me right. I'm not advocating for divination, familiar spirits, or cultic operations, because I know those are in, and also in, in, in operation. No, no, I'm talking about the genuine ministers of God, the genuine move of God that's prompted by the Holy Spirit. That has to come to an end, whereby we, we can't develop these infightings. It's about the Holy Spirit cannot be divided among himself. He can't do that. He can't. So, Paul comes to correct this, which is very loud in our time again. I've just spoken in the digressed and tried to bring even ministers within them because they spirit those that are coming, even those that are up there, sometimes people feel threatened. Why should you feel threatened yet the work is supposed to be prompted by the Holy Spirit? Anyone that is unsafe in their calling, he is not so sure if indeed they are called. Anyone that is not satisfied with the gifting they have, but they feel inferior, there is something that is not right. If the Holy Spirit is fully involved in your life, you cannot be inferior, you can't be intimidated, you cannot 
have this competitive syndrome within your life. You cannot be envious of that. You cannot find yourself in that kind of field or sphere. You can't. You can, you'll be joyful and glad for what God has bestowed upon that which you're able to do. And when you see others being used greatly by the Lord, you'll be able to thank God for them because they are doing the same work in the kingdom of the Lord. Rather than fighting them, castigating them, curtailing them, that's not appropriate. Be content with what God has given to you. Enhance it. Make it much better. History has taught us. The church history has taught us. Smith goes, Smith goes forth. The church history tells us that actually was largely used in raising the dead. He was a, a man of faith. And people like the late Lester Sambran were able to benefit from the mantle that Smith Smith, Smith was worth had. We have people like the late Till Osborne. People like the late Bill Graham. We have people like Charles Stein who just died early this year. You know, people that knew the realm of operation. People like the late a. A. Allen, Charles Finn. If you read about their lives, you'll understand their call. You understand the grace they were carrying. You can easily tell. People like Oral Roberts, you can easily tell. You have to stand and be distinguished in the area of your grace and your assignment that God has given you as a person. This can only happen but by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. I have not begun talking about the giftings of the Holy Spirit and how you operate through those giftings, no. But I'm just trying to put this across also in advance for you to understand that indeed, if you're feeling unsafe and insecure as a minister and as a believer, because you feel others are threatening you in terms of their progress, they need to find out, is the Holy Spirit really guiding and leading you? Because he's not behind all that. You are a worshiper. Another worshiper is also coming up very well. You feel in fear, you feel intimidated. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's the wax of the flesh. So listen, one of the mistakes, some of the mistakes that we uh, bring all us across as believers, and Paul was able to bring across. But for verse 5 says, when one say, for when one say, I belong to Paul, and another belong to Apollos. I do not prove in yourselves ordinary and changed men, creating division among ministers. We are all subject to Christ. No minister owns any believer, regardless of where they are around the world. That's when the time comes, they go. We just lost one of the great generals in this country, Dr. Joe Kai, a man, a pioneer of the Pentecost movement in this country way back 1957 those early days he has preached until his last breath at the age of 86 he has preached over almost 66 or so years that's a great great general and has done remarkable work he's a founder he was a founder of one of the largest churches in this country ministry in this country we really thank god for such a great grace that has rested but his work is evident now we cannot be able to propagate what we call divisive gospel no we are all one body functioning differently based on the giftings but we are one body the agenda is one the one that has given us the assignment is the father Verse 5, the Bible says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Inserting servants, not heads of parties, through whom you believed, as the Lord appointed to each his task. I planted Apollo watered, but God 
all the while was working, making it grow, he gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, or he waters, but only God who makes it grow and becomes greater. He who plants and he who waters are equal, one aim of the same importance and esteem, yet each shall receive his own world wages according to his own labor. For we are fellow workers, workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. You are God's garden, vineyard, field, and the cultivation. You are God's building. According to the grace, special endowment for my task, God uh, bestowed on me like a skillful architect, master builder. I laid the foundation. Now another man is building upon it, but let each man be careful on how he builds upon it. For no, 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 for no other foundation can be, can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. But if anyone builds the foundation, whether it is built with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, uh, hay, straw, the work of each one will become plain, openly known, shown for what it is. On the day of Christ will disclose, declare it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test, critically appraise the character, the worth of the work each person has done. If the work which any person has built on this foundation, any product of his efforts, whatever survives this test, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of it all, losing his world, though he himself will be saved, but only as one who passed through the fire. Verse 16, do you not design and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, are God's temple, his sanctuary, that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you? to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. So collectively and individually have to understand that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul has explained so much in this chapter. I don't want to go further. I want to be able to just to be within the limits of what you're learning about the work of the Holy Spirit. So maturity is another aspect that is of great essence when it comes to understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul is able to make it clear that actually everybody has been given their own task and work. Do your task responsibly and more so collaborating with the Holy Spirit. Let him guide you and direct you, and that way you'll be able to. You know, I look at companies. I'll give examples of companies. We have directors, we have managers, we have uh, foremen, we have, uh, you know, those that are laboring, we have secretaries. Everybody, if you work in those organizations, those companies, everybody is busy at their work. Working for the owner of the company, and everybody is committed at their work because everybody wants to simply satisfy their boss. Same applies to the church. We have been given different responsibilities by the grace of God. And the one that is helping us to carry out those particular responsibilities is the Holy Spirit of God. So once you discover what you're supposed to do, do it at best. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and help you. Keep learning, keep growing. And you don't have any time creating these rifts and these wranglings that we always witness in different quarters where the church is concerned. Don't playing another part doesn't make you better. Without the Holy Spirit, we're all nothing. Without Christ, we are all useless. Our importance comes as a result of Christ and more so the Holy Spirit. Other than that, we are nothing. We are nothing without God. We are nothing without the Holy Spirit. We are nothing, literally, literally nothing. Let's learn to appreciate His presence in our lives as a people.
something else the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Verse number 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 3 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, that is liberty, emancipation from bondage, freedom. Uh, where the Holy Spirit is fully involved in any form of setup, church setup. Number one, people not feel threatened. People feel that uh, that with that freedom, not just free from free, uh, freedom from sin or from any form of bondage, but again, there's that freedom when you go into a church. You don't feel, I know there are places you go and you're told if you leave the church, Ah, you'll be cast if you leave the church, it will never be well with you. Listen, we don't own people, we are just stewards of God's grace. If anyone wants to leave and go to another place, no problem. Bless them, let them go. But this tendency of threatening people and making them feel enslaved to that fellowship is not godly. The Holy Spirit does not simply enslave people. No. You don't need to go a place and feel threatened. You know. Your blessings are just here. If you don't come here, you will not get blessings here. Honestly. We are not the ones to determine that. No. God's people are free to go wherever they want to go, provided it's a godly setup and of course they must find a home where God wants them to find a place of fellowship find a spiritual leader that's going to guide them and cause them to grow if they feel they are dissatisfied here there's no problem let them go let them go don't ever own any person as a minister don't let them go if they feel led to go to another place it's okay even you where you are you are not the same place you are you are to some point some place and God confirmed your assignment and now here you are doing the work of the Lord. So at the end of the day, let, let believers feel at liberty, not for them to become arrogant and to become disobedient, no, but let them just feel at liberty whenever they come to the house of God. Let them not feel threatened. They are not feel like they're being manipulated or they're being forced to do things. No. They have to do the, it with liberty. There must be, that's what, that's what the Lord is, that is liberty. That is liberty, that's freedom. So the Holy Spirit gives us liberty, gives us freedom. He helps us walk a life of freedom. He sets us free. Another thing the Holy Spirit does, Romans 8 14 For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God you are a child of God, and because you're a child of God, you ought to be led by the Holy Spirit in all your undertakings. Let the Holy Spirit lead you, guide you, direct you. It's very important to be led of the Holy Spirit. That confirms your sonship as a child of God. And uh, just to give more scriptures on the same, If you look at Matthew chapter 1, chapter 4, verse 1, rather, 
Jesus, then Jesus was led, guided by the Holy Spirit to the wilderness. I'll read again. Verse number nine. And in those days, John, Jesus rather, came to Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water at once, he, John, saw the heavens torn open. He came up out of the water and at once he saw the heavens torn open and the hospital like a dove coming down to enter into him. He came and there came a voice from within heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased with. Verse 12. Immediately the Holy Spirit from within drove him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit drove him into the Will Dennis drove him. Of course, we know very well what Luke chapter number chapter four, verse one says. Um, verse one, then Jesus, full of the full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan, and was laid in by the Holy Spirit. So we are looking at the three servants of God: Matthew. Uh, look and Mark were able to take this to account that indeed Christ was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. We as children of God, we are supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit all the time and that is every single day of our lives. We are supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. That is one of his assignments to leaders. I want us to look at a scenario here that happened of course to Apostle Paul Acts of Apostles chapter 16 verse 6 Paul says and Paul and Silas passed through the territory of uh, Fiji Galatia having uh, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the word in the province of Asia so Paul and Silas had wanted to go to Asia to proclaim the gospel, but the Holy Spirit of God prohibited them from going there. You know? And when they had come opposite Mesia and uh, uh, tried to go into Bethany, the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Again, they were not permitted to go to uh, Bethany. So passing by by Mesia and of course they went to Troas, down to Troas. There in a vision appeared to Paul in the night a man of Macedonia pleading with him saying come over to Macedonia helpers. And when he had seen the vision including Luke at once endeavored to go to Macedonia confident in, in inferring that God had called us to proclaim the glad tidings, the gospel. Therefore, setting sail to Troas, uh, we came in direct to the house of uh, Samothrace. In the day, went to Neapolis. Now, uh, I wanted to understand this. Paul and his fellow ministers, of course, they had a calling on their lives, they had the anointing, the grace. But every move they wanted to make, they were cautious of the Holy Spirit. They could have gone to Asia by their own will. But Paul was a man that was very cautious and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And this is a big lesson to all of us. While they were planning to go to Bethany, they were planning to go to Asia, uh, the Spirit of the Lord did not allow them to go there. Why? And while they was in that particular, probably thinking, why are they not being allowed to go there? Paul suddenly got a vision. Macedonian call. And we don't understand about the Macedonian call and what happened. And so much took place in Macedonia. But what about if Paul was not sensitive to the Holy Spirit? What could have happened? Well, as I was saying earlier on, that is very important, very paramount for us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy 
spirit it's very 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 important because at the end of the day in as much as maybe you are called of God you have of the calling of God you have the anointing of the Lord upon your life but at the end of the day still just like Apostle Paul and his fellow ministers they were cautious of the leading of the Holy Spirit and of course I've learned from numerous men of God when you look at this man of God that is late now, Evangelist Bonke, this man of God made a great impact in Africa, immense impact in Africa. Like his call was largely to the continent of Africa. Not that he was not going to other places, but largely the great impact was witnessed in Africa. And you know, you can look at men of God across the nations. You know, there are particular nations and territories they don't easily go. Not because they can go, but they always wait for God's prompting and for God's leading. Why? Because at the end of the day, any place that you go, God always avails grace. You know, He always avails a grace and all that is needed to be done in that particular place. So it's always good to be able to understand which territory is God taking me, which it is God taking, which people is God leading me to. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen, like, when you look at this man of God, Benny Hill, he was, in, he was having a church in Orlando, Florida, then years later, a church of almost 7,000 people, God told him, you know what, leave that particular church. And, of course, he had to go to Texas. That's where he was able to get, and now he's running the ministry there, the healing ministry, and, of course, the teaching ministry. But he left the church in Orlando. You see, again, it's always good, as I said again, to follow the prompting of God. Of course, this great man of God, T.D. Jakes, was in Carolina, North Carolina, I suppose, if I'm not wrong. And of course, he was prompted by God to come to Dallas, Texas, where he has been able to establish his ministry. And he's doing a great work there. So when you study the life of men of God, those that are and those that are gone, they were, they were extremely cautious of the leading of the Holy Spirit. So it's very important, even in our time, that we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, to lead us in a way that we can become more effective and more productive in the matters of God. You need to understand where, which people has God led you to, which area, which country, which city. You know, it's very important. You don't just go, let me go because I'm supposed to go. No, God has to lead us by His Spirit. Well, I have so much to say. However, time is gone. I'm going to share more about the work of the Holy Spirit, my prayer that God will help you, guide you in your journey of faith and Muslim ministry as you serve the Lord. And of course, you'll keep on seeing God's goodness and God's greatness taking place in your life as a person. Now, before I close, uh, I want you to understand, there was a time I was out of this country and then of course I was planning to come back to the nation. This is a testimony that I'm giving and uh, what happened is, so our flight delayed was about two hours, so they brought another kind of you know, flight, which was not the one that was supposed to come, and we boarded. And then when we were boarding, I asked the cabin crew, what really happened? Why did you guys delay? And then said the flight that we had had a problem, so we had to change to this one. So I said, okay, that's great. But while not, when I was just going to see the Lord told me, this one will have a problem. And I said, Lord, what mean problem? I said, this one will have a problem. And uh, the Lord told me to pray. So I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and flying almost six or so hours to the country. When almost just getting to land in our nation at the airport, I saw the plane going down, knew that we were landing, and I was like, okay, God told me there was a problem, and I don't see any problem. Suddenly, then we began going up. Then we began going round and round. I'm wondering what is going on. We are already in the city. We are supposed to be landing. What's going on? And the Lord reminded me. I told you to pray. So I began praying and began praying. I prayed. The Lord led me by spirit. I prayed. For 45 minutes, we are in the skies. And uh, later on, of course, the plane was about to land. And I went again and asked the, you know, the cabin crew, I asked him, what was going on? What was happening? He said, well, the flaps of the airplane had refused to open, so it was quite hard for us to land. I said, oh, okay. Then I remembered what God had told me. So it's always good to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Well, I'll share more with you as we get more time and for you to understand the God's goodness and how the Holy Spirit works in us and with us and for us to the glory of the Father, the glory of God, who has simply saved us through the person of Christ and gained this opportunity to serve Him in this 
life. God bless you. Keep watching with your loved ones. In Jesus' name, peace. Amen.